Hey everyone. Uh, so welcome to this new episode of our webinar series with Tiba. Uh, we'll start now if every, everyone is ready. Uh, so we appreciate your interest and support uh, in joining us. So thanks for that. Uh, for those of you who might not know us, we are TIBA, which stands for Tsinghua International Blockchain Association. So we're basically a bunch of Tsinghua students. We're interested in blockchain. We do research or work with blockchain. And we organize such events to help people learn about blockchain and do some networking and stuff like that. Uh, so you're interested in, in us or want to learn more about us, then you can just directly message us on WeChat. And for a few weeks, we've been doing this webinar series, Introduction to Blockchain. Uh, previously, we've talked about the history of blockchain, and we've talked about some technical stuff like uh, cryptography and consensus. And today, we are going to talk about Bitcoin, which is probably the best known application of blockchain. So without further ado, uh, please welcome our member, Samuel, who will talk about Bitcoin. Yeah, so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin. And my goal for this lecture is to to let you have a basic idea of how Bitcoin works in a, in a fundamental way. Um, and we're going to do that by talking about four things that I think constitutes Bitcoin. The first thing is identity. So how are you presented um, on the blockchain? And then second is transaction. Um, you know, Bitcoin being a digital currency, transaction is definitely a huge part of the system. And we're going to see how it works. The third part is decentralized network. Um, being a digital currency itself is not that impressive, right? What's impressive is that it's able to, Bitcoin was able to do it in a decentralized way. And we're going to talk about how Bitcoin made that happen. And then lastly, we're going to talk about Bitcoin blockchain. We'll kind of summarize the three things above and then give you a big picture of how Bitcoin works. So Bitcoin. So the first thing is Bitcoin identity. And the first thing you need to know is a private key. So private key is just a randomly generated number that's 256 bit. Um, it's like your password. So you got to keep it safe. If you lose it, then you won't be able to access your Bitcoin at all. And it's usually represented in 64 characters. Uh, I have an example here. So this is a valid um, private key right here. Um, and another thing is that because, because Bitcoin is decentralized, there's no place for you to create an account or kind of register. So what you do instead is you randomly generate a private key. And then we move on to step two, which is generating a public key. So a public key is generated from your private key using something called ECDSA. Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. It's basically a math function that kind of has the, your private key to a public key. And the key feature of the, the algorithm is that given a public key, you cannot find the private key that generated the public key. So you can think of it as public key is your username and the private key is a password. So you cannot find a password given a username, which makes sense, right? And it's usually in 66, uh, characters and here's an example. Here's the public key that matches the private key that I showed you before. So that's the algorithm. If you're interested, you can take a look. And then finally, we have your address. So an address is generated from your public key. So here's a graph right here that kind of demonstrates the process. You have your public key right here. And then you go through kind of some process, you know, you got your public, public key hash and then you keep going. And then finally you have your address, which is 20 bytes. And then it's like your user ID. And we'll talk about why you need this in a minute. So private key, we'll kind of summarize the thing we talked about before. So private key is like your password. You use it to redeem your Bitcoin. And the public key is like your username use it to receive Bitcoin. And then your address is like a user ID. So it allows you to be found. It's like, so your address is like um, your WeChat ID, right? Can you give it to other people so that people can um, send friend requests or something like that? So the whole process works like this. So you have a private key that's randomly generated. 
and then you generate the, a public key based on the private key, and then you move all the way and then generate another thing called Bitcoin address. That's the thing you send to people um, for you to receive Bitcoin. And the wise advice here is that you, um, people tend to use a new address for each transaction just to keep it safe uh, so that it's harder to track you, kind of your activity on the Bitcoin network. And there's also this thing called wallet. So basically that the wallet is a thing that holds the private keys for you. And there's two types of wallet. There's hot storage. And then there's cold storage. So hot storage is basically online wallet. There's mobile wallet, like an app, or a web wallet, like a website. And then cold storage is offline. It's not connected to the internet. So there's things like paper wallet, hardware wallet, and brain wallet. So here's an example of paper wallet. And you can see right here, that's the Bitcoin address. And then right here is a private key. So whenever you're trying to receive something, you get give people this um, QR code with these strings. And then whenever you're trying to spend your Bitcoin, you use this side. <clears throat> and there's also this thing called digital currency. So the question then comes is, how do you know if someone's sending their own Bitcoin instead of somebody else's? And the answer to, to that is digital signature. So how it works is that we have an example here. Um, here's Alice. Right, uh, was trying to send a message, follow Bob to Bob, but she wants to make sure that Bob knows it's from her, not somebody else. So what she does is she signed it with her private key. It's all math and cryptography here. Um, I'm not gonna get into detail how exactly why it works, but just she signed it with her private key, and then that kind of have a new, there's a new sort of generator message here that's signed by Alice. And then he, she sent this message, to Bob. So now Bob received this message and he's able to verify that this message is from Alice by using Alice public key to verify that it's from Alice. That's a unique feature of private and public key that you're able to um, sign a message using a private key and then to verify, you can use a public key to verify. So we can imagine in Bitcoin, um, the message you're sending is transactions, right? And then by signing a transaction, you are saying that you approve this transaction. So here's an example, right? <clears throat> um, so Alice is trying to send a transaction to Bob. So here's Alice and Bob. Here's Alice Bitcoin. And then here's her private key. And then she wants to send this these Bitcoin to Bob and then to Bob's address, right? And then she signed this, this transaction with her digital signature. And then she broadcasts this to the blockchain. So now broadcasts to the blockchain. And then the job of the blockchain is then to verify the transaction by checking that Alice signature using private key. And now Bob is able to redeem those Bitcoin by using his private key. And notice here is that there's no work done on Bob's part all he has to do is to provide his address. So another thing that is a challenge in creating Bitcoin is something called double spending problem. And you know, it's it's basically spending the same money more than once. And it is the ultimate enemy of digital money. It is what has been keeping people from creating something like Bitcoin for many years because they couldn't solve the double spending problem in a decentralized way. And so how Bitcoin solves this is that something called UTXO or on-spend transaction outputs. You can think of it as piggy banks. So you either spend all or none. We'll have an example later, but basically the, the contained data, the data that's in a UTXO are two things. One is the value, so the amount of Bitcoin. And the second thing is the owner's address, who owns the Bitcoin. And you can see from now that Bitcoin is not an account or balance based system. You don't have a like a number that a Bitcoin that you own on the blockchain. What you own is UTXO, so tiny piggy banks um, that's floating around.
And just as a side note, um, one of the reasons why some some people consider blockchain as a revolutionary technology is it's able to solve the double spending problem. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, in the era of internet, you know, copies are being made all the time. Copies of information are being made all the time. So when you send a message, you're not spending, you're not sending the exact message that you're typing, you're sending a copy of it. So in the first generation of digital revolution, there's an internet of information, copies of information. But then what blockchain brings to the table is the second generation of so the second kind of revolution of the digital revolution is that the internet of value. So you're able to send something that's unique um, to somebody over the internet. Now coming back to Bitcoin, here's an example, right? So Alice is trying to send three Bitcoin to Bob. Here's Alice. So she has this UTXO, this piggy bank, and then you know she either has to spend all or none. So she has to break the piggy bank and then send three of the uh, bitcoin to bob and then two to herself so that's basically how it works and then you might ask what if she wants to send seven bitcoin to bob well then she have to break two of her utxos so one is five bitcoin the other three bitcoin and then send seven to bob one to herself and a more realistic example here is that there's something called a transaction fee that's um, usually included in the transaction that's given to the miners. We'll, we'll talk about mining in just a minute, but it's basically people who verify transactions. So here's more of a realistic view of what a transaction looks like. So you want to send five dollars, just five Bitcoin to someone, and then three goes to yourself, and then one point eight maybe ish go to Oh, three good dollars go to Bob and one point eight go to yourself, and then the re remaining go to the miners. And then just some terminology here. There's something called UTXO pool. You could imagine just like a memory pool of all the current UTXOs, and they're used by miners to verify transaction, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, as in, and then there, there's another thing called transaction pool. Think of it as memory pool of all the current pending transactions and use my miner to pick transaction to verify. And then here's an example of this. So Bob right here is trying to send 50 Bitcoin, trying to spend 50 Bitcoin. So, and then he's trying to send 0 0.5 to Alice and then the remaining to himself, right? With the change address for security. And then Alice here received this Bitcoin and included it with some of her previous UTXOs right here. And then she's able to combine those and send it to her employee. And just to kind of summarize your transaction. So a transaction is that you have to say you you're, you're, you own this Bitcoin address and then you're trying to send, you're trying to spend the Bitcoin that's sent to you from transaction A, B, and C. And then you pay a certain amount to some address. And then the miner gets to keep the remaining as a tip. And then you sign the transaction. And that's how the transaction works on Bitcoin. Um, here's some more information if you're interested. Just kind of summarize how Bitcoin transaction work in a nice way. I'm going to skip this part for now. And then here's a more complicated example. And even more complicated so you can read it later um so yeah this lecture is not over yet so we want to thank you for joining and give you some hands-on experience of with bitcoin so as promised we're gonna get do some bitcoin giveaway today so here's the step the first step is you join the group chat i'll put up the qr code in a minute and then second step is to install a wallet and then we'll have direction to how to do that um in a minute and then the third step is you post your Bitcoin address in the group chat on WeChat. And that's basically it. You can enjoy Bitcoin from there. Um, so here's the QR code. I'll maybe give you three minutes to join the group. Um, and if you're using a laptop, you can just scan it using your phone. But if you're using your phone to watch this, you can take a screenshot of your QR code and then go to WeChat and then scan the photo if you know how to do that. Or you can just send your WeChat ID to this chat 
in this Tencent meeting, and we'll be able to add you into the group. So three minutes. We'll have to step to insert a wallet in a uh, in a minute here. We'll let people scan the QR code first, and then we'll move on to installing a wallet. Maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, so if you have been joining the group, you can send your reach ID to the chat in this Tencent meeting, and one of us will add you to the group. So here's a step to installing a wallet. So the wallet we're gonna use is APC Wallet. It's on WeChat. You can Follow the step here. So search for ABC WeChat ABC wallet, excuse me, here, and then click this one. And then you follow the steps to a wallet. And then there's a couple more steps after this. So I'll give you one minute to follow up up to this point. And then there's a couple more steps after this. Um, right here. So you click that and it's going to put my so to the group. Uh, we're going to maybe move on from there. Um, you can do this later after the lecture. So we're going to upload the PowerPoint later. Um, so here's the behind the scene of what happens when you do this thing. So here's a wallet. In this case, ABC wallet, and it's the wallet, 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 what a wallet does is it generates a private and public key pair for you, and then also a, an address, right? And then you take this address, send it to the WeChat group, and then now we, on our part, we have to send our Bitcoin, sign it with a private key, and then send it to your address. When you're going to broadcast it to, to the blockchain and then the blockchain is going to try to verify those transactions and now you are able to spend your bitcoin so yeah that's kind of behind the scenes so now you might have the question of who verifies those transactions right who are able to be sort of like the middleman and verify the transaction if it's a decentralized system. And the answer to that, to that is mining. So how a mine, how mining works is that, so when you're spending your Bitcoin, right, the, the transaction gets put into the transaction pool that we talked about before. 
and then now the miner a miner comes along picks some transaction out of the transaction pool and then verify the transaction by making sure that each transaction is signed by the private key matching the public key or address on the UTXO and then after verifying they put all the verified transaction into a block and then publish that block so some terminology miner is people who do the work of mining and in theory everyone could be a miner that's in theory and then mining um, it's the process of verifying transaction and put them into a new block. You solve a puzzle, which is important that we're going to talk about right after this, and then publish this block to the blockchain. And miners are in the, in the race to compete who can publish a new block first. And it's about 10 minutes that there's a new block born on the Bitcoin network. And here's the part um, about solving the puzzle. So this thing called proof of work. You might have heard of it before. It's the process of solving a cryptographic puzzle. And some key features about it is it's hard to solve, but easy to verify. And the only way to solve it is by using brute force. There's no other better way to solve this problem, this puzzle. And then it consumes a lot of energy, which come back to later. So in Bitcoin, the puzzle you're trying to do, the puzzle you're trying to solve is you have to find a nonce. So one nonce is stand for number only used once. It's basically you have to find a number such that the hash of the block results in a certain amount leading to zero. And we're actually gonna do, it's kind of hard to understand it this way, so I'm gonna do a demo here. Um, hopefully you're able to see this. Um, so kind of before, what we talked about before, um, here's some data. Um, what a hash is, you have some input data, right? So, and then with each input data, there's a hash to it. So it's uniquely matched to the to the data. So whenever you change the data, even slightly, you're able to have a different hash. And then, and what a block is, in a simplified way, of course, is that you have some kind of block number, right? So one, block number one, number two, number three, so on. And then here's the nonce. Here's some data. And then here's the hash of the entire block. So you have some data, maybe, you know, Sam, I'm gonna send 50 Bitcoins to Peter. Oops. And then notice that the hash of the thing changes, right? And the, the puzzle here is to find a nonce such that the hash starts with four leading zeros. So what do you do? You do one, and then you do two, and you do three, and then four, and then you keep doing it until you find one that starts with four leading zeros. So when I click this mine button, what it does is essentially increase the number of nonce by one at a time and then check if the hash starts with four leading zeros. That's essentially the process of the proof of work. So if we're lucky here, it shouldn't take long for it to find one. You now sometimes it take longer than usual here. Oh, there we go. So the nonce for this one is 14, uh, 143,000 123. So it has to go from one or two all the way to the number to find this this puzzle to solve this puzzle. And now coming back to our slide. So hopefully now you understand what finding a nonce is. And one other interesting part about this is that you're able to adjust the mining difficulty by changing the number of leading zeros. So the more leading zeros you require, the, the more difficult it takes to solve the puzzle. Um, here's a, another example I'm going to skip for now. And then we did the demo. And there's some evolution of Bitcoin mining. So back in 2009, Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, was able to use his laptop to mine Bitcoin. So CPUs. And then people started to realize that GPU actually performed better than C CPU. And then 
some people then realize that you can put a lot of GPUs together and then solve, try to solve the puzzle. And then later, people even create some hardware called ASIC that's specifically for solving Bitcoin puzzles. So it does nothing else but solving Bitcoin puzzles. And while what, and what now what it really looks like is this. So we have something called Bitcoin uh, mining farm. So it's basically a lot of ASIC in the facility. And then all they do is mine Bitcoin. So when I say that in theory, everyone could become a miner. That's in theory, right? Now you have to have some sort of capital for you to start mining Bitcoin. And then now it's even impossible to mine on a laptop or using your GPUs. And as a result of that, Bitcoin consumes a lot of energy, right? So here's your um, energy chart here. Bitcoin actually consumes more energy than some countries, like Switzerland, Greece, Israel, and Ireland, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, right? So kind of talk about um, mining in more detail. So the steps you do to mine a block if you want to become a miner, is first of all, you have to download the entire blockchain. And the second, you have to verify um, the pen, some pending transactions and then put those verified transactions with block. Find a valid nonce, so solve the puzzle, or you can call it proof of work. And then you broadcast your block to the network and then you make profit. So kind of hint to what we're going to go to here. So here about the question of why would people mine Bitcoin, right? Why would people do all the work and pay for all the electricity and things to mine Bitcoin? Well, the answer, as I had before, is incentive. You are able to make profit out of this. So mining incentive, some people call it the Coinbase transaction that's included in the blockchain. And then it's basically the reward that miners get when they publish a new block. And so they get some Bitcoins when they publish a block, right? So the amount of Bitcoin that a miner get for each block is reduced to half the amount every 210,000 blocks, about four years. So back in 2008 or early 2009, is when Satoshi mined the first Bitcoin, he gets 50 Bitcoins for um, creating a block and publishing on the blockchain. And then in 2012, it got cut down to 25 Bitcoins. 2016, 12.5 Bitcoins. And now in 2020, it's actually 6.25 Bitcoins. It's most likely going to be on next somewhere next week, so May 12. Um, so there's a countdown, actually, to when Bitcoin's going to, uh, the amount of Bitcoin is going to be cut to half. So it's probably like five or six days now um and then so what allows what's as a, as a result of the cutting in half bitcoins there are only 21 million bitcoins that could be mined or created that's a design by situation right and then if you calculate it the last bitcoin will be mined in 20 um 200 and 2140 so here's kind of the Bitcoin inflation rate versus time. You can see that. You can see that as the year goes, as the year goes, and then the inflation rate of Bitcoin actually decreased dramatically um, over time, approaching zero. So that's a very good design for for a currency. So here's a article on how my Bitcoin mining works on Coindesk that you can check out if you're interested. And to finish the demo that we started with. So we talk about a block, right? And what a blockchain is essentially a bunch of blocks linked together. So you have block one, two, three, so on. And then for block one, there's no previous block. So that's just empty. And then block two, you have something that points to a previous block. So notice that the hash of the previous block here is the same as the hash of block number one. And then the previous of block number three is the hash of block number two. And then what's interesting about this is if you try to change the data, right? 
so you tr type something in and it, was, it turns red, right? Because the hash of it is not for leading zero. So what you do is have to mine this block, right? So you have to try to find a nonce such that the hash starts with four leading zeros. And okay, now you found it. And then what you do, notice here is that, now this, this one changed, right? So the previous, um, the, the, the previous pointer of block three points to the hash of block two, but now the previous changes. So as a result, the hash of the block changes as well. So now the hash of block three doesn't start with four leading zero. So you have to mine this as well. Totally you get the idea here is that if you change one block, you have to you have to kind of mine this block and then mine every block that comes after it, which requires a lot of work. And this is the immutability um, aspect of the blockchain. And then what distributed means is basically you have a, some blockchain, right? And then you give it to someone else, peer A. And then the same blockchain, you give it to another person, peer B and then peer C. So what now what happens is if peer B is trying to change some data, right? And then he actually mines all, even though he mines all of the blocks that he has, but still his record still doesn't match A or C. So it's even harder to change something on the blockchain. And a token here is put, just replace it, uh, the data with transaction. So it's more like Bitcoin, uh, block in Bitcoin now. So same block number and then not, and then you have some transaction, right? So 25 Bitcoin or whatever the currency is, this person to this person. Only The only thing on Bitcoin is that these are not names here. These are for ad addresses, right? So it's like random streams of number. And the same thing apply, right? If you try to change this so from four to like say 46, then you have to mine this block and then mine this block. And then even though if you do it, other people won't agree on it, right? And then when you add the coin base, it's basically what we talk about a mining incentive, the reward the miner gets. So when you mine this block, you have a coin base transaction here that's sent to the miner, right? So every block has a coin base transaction. And then the second thing that I want to show you guys is this interesting thing that I found yesterday. It basically records the Bitcoin transaction in real time. So that's the last block that was mined. And then every ball that drops now is a Bitcoin transaction being made in real time. So you see right here, this 35 Bitcoins and then 15 Bitcoins. Just to show you guys that blockchain is, you know, public and you're able to access this. And people have come up with some creative way of describing it. So now heading back to our slide, I did that. And I wanted to talk about, lastly, you want to talk about how Bitcoin is so important. So, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is, you can think of it as a immutable transaction together base or a decentralized network. So what a decentralized network means is you can see from the, the right here, um, here's something that centralized all that. So Visa, Facebook, whatever, they look like this, right? They have the, the database in the center with power in the center and people sort of access that. But what blockchain brings to the table and what Bitcoin does is it decentralized the power. So now you have more people who are able to, who are able to kind of contribute to this, to the database and have more distributed power and then you know, the ideal way is to go to a distributed system, which is hard, but that's the, in theory, and the ideal way of Bitcoin. So the core value of Bitcoin for me is that it is a immutable ledger of data without relying on the central authority. And then it's a digital assets with real value. And then it's a digital currency without boundary. And what I hope for Bitcoin and blockchain technology is that it'll be a technology that puts us in the right direction. Um, it'll be able to unite us all and even bring us 
and then being a more level playing field for everyone, just like what the internet did back in the 1990s and early 2000s. And Bitcoin contributes a lot to that mission. Uh, that's a, as a starting point. And I'm just super excited to see how it's going to turn on in the future. So yeah, thank you for listening. I hope you learned something today. Uh, for those who haven't sent your address to the group, please do so. We'll we'll post the the, the slides to the group later. Um, so please send your address there. Otherwise, you'll miss out on your Bitcoin. So and next time we're going to talk about Ethereum, which is the second biggest digital currency right now. So be sure to attend. It's going to be fun. And with that, I want to thank you all again. You can ask questions in the group. Talk to me or people at Tiba. Appreciate you being here today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Sam, for the great presentation. Uh, so I see there's one question in the chat. So please, for your questions, we don't want to take up too much of your time. So please send us questions in the group chat on WeChat, and we will address all your questions. So just go ahead. Uh, also, we will share this uh, these slides with you. So if there's something that uh, you didn't understand that you can review and even ask us later. Uh, for the wallet thing, if you're in the if you're in the Bitcoin giveaway group, then make sure you download the wallet and send us your address, and we will send you some Bitcoin shortly. Uh, so that's it for today, and thanks for joining. If you have any feedback or questions, then you can find us in in our groups. So thank you everyone and see you next time.